In the video I'm about to present, I will recount some of the most terrifying cave incidents that I have previously covered on this channel. This includes the notorious episode involving the Crooked Swamp Cave, among many other unnerving tales. I have a quick warning for those who are new here. These stories are known to provoke anxiety, so I advise viewer discretion. In the rural north central part of New Jersey, there is a three-part cave system with a checkered history named Crooked Swamp Cave. This cave is the major one of a half dozen of caves and many sinkholes in the area sitting on limestone bedrock. Crooked Swamp is sourced by numerous springs that have slowly dissolved away the mineral bedrock forming this cave over thousands of years. It might well be thought of as a cave system rather than just one single cave. With its many parallels and connecting passages totaling 1,200 feet, this is the longest known cave in New Jersey. From the main entrance of cave number two, at the southeast end of the ridge, it is strongly advised that reaching the small five foot high room should only be attempted by those who are very thin. This side passage requires much squeezing. Caution is advised in the five foot high room because of the unstable and potentially dangerous ceiling. Beyond this room, Touching hands with someone coming from the second entrance is possible, but only very small cavers can get through. As a result of the following story, the New Jersey Cave Conservatory and Trust installed custom-made lockable safety gates. Visitors who wish to explore the Crooked Swamp Cave must first contact the New Jersey Conservatory to arrange for a guided tour. Donald Weltner grew up wanting to do good in the world. So it did not surprise his family when he applied to the State Trooper Academy to become a New Jersey State Trooper. He graduated, which was a significant accomplishment for him. He made some strong friendships with his fellow State Troopers, and after Donald was settled in with his new career, he decided to start a family. He got married and had multiple children. When he was not spending time with his family, he would hang out with his State Trooper friends. One of his fellow State Troopers introduced Donald to cave exploring. He became obsessed with finding new caves and mapping them out. It did get to a point that Donald would go out with his friends and lose track of time, which would cause his friends and family to get very concerned about his whereabouts. Nobody knew where he was sometimes. Donald was always the leader when he'd go exploring with his caving friends and would be the first one to enter the cave. As a result, he would frequently find himself in dangerous parts that most people would never experience. At the time, some caves in New Jersey were unmapped. These are the caves that Donald was attracted to the most. Unmapped caves can be dangerous places because of falling rocks, flooding of sections, and extreme exhaustion. One of the less common dangers is getting stuck. Donald never heard of someone getting stuck in a cave, so that was something that never crossed his mind. Once Donald's two sons, Christopher and Roger, grew older, he would bring them along on his caving adventures. Donald wanted to help share his love of the outdoors to as many people as possible, which ultimately inspired him to become a Boy Scout Scoutmaster. This way, he could leave out groups of people to explore his most passionate thing in life, caves. He became the leader of the Millstone Township Troop 116. The Boy Scouts in this troop looked up to Donald, some considered him to be the father figure that they didn't have in their own life. The scouts in Donald's troop loved going on spelunking trips because he was so passionate, and all of the energy that he gave off was contagious. His sons Christopher and Roger quickly became advanced cavers at the age of 12 and 14. Finally, after many caving trips with his troop, Donald felt they were ready to go on the less visited and most advanced cave in New Jersey called Crooked Swamp Cave. His troop had requested to go there many times before, but Donald knew that it would be very challenging for them and always backed away from planning a trip there. It wasn't until a friend of Donald's told him how easy it was for his sons to navigate the twists and turns of the cave that Donald felt it was about time that he led his troop there. The troop was notified that their wish to explore the Crooked Swamp Cave would come true the following week. They would finally go on the trip to the cave that they've been anticipating for so long. 
At 2 p.m. on Saturday, March 27th, Donald and the 12 scouts, including his two sons, Christopher and Roger, entered cave number two in the Crooked Cave Swamp system. The cave opening was only 16 inches high and 28 inches wide, requiring them to crawl on their hands and knees just to get inside. You would probably miss it if you didn't know where the cave was. It was a joke among the locals that if there was ever an extreme event happening in the world, this cave would be a safe place to hide because it was so far off the grid. There are a lot of offshoots in this cave, but for this trip, they were strictly off limits. The scouts were told to stay together and use a buddy system, just in case anything went wrong. The scouts were much smaller than Donald, so he was not worried about them getting stuck, but there are many other hazards that could still cause them harm. The danger and unknowns added to the excitement for the scouts, and they were having the time of their life forking their way through the cave. The walls were cold and wet with a slime layer in some areas. Bat droppings lined the cave floor, and the smell was pungent but not repulsive. At the time, it was speculated that this cave might be connected to two other caves in the Crooked Swamp system, but it had yet to be determined. To make this connection, you must go through a small room at the back of the cave. Without telling anyone, Donald wanted to find out if these caves were connected, and he already decided that he wanted to go to that small room that he heard so much about, but he's never been to before. Previous attempts failed as his friends had always wanted to turn back before reaching the room. He was with the scouts for a while, but eventually broke off to do his own exploring. Once there was no more adult supervision, some of the scouts started to go into the forbidden offshoots of the cave. They had also heard about the room in the back and wanted to see if the caves connected. The scouts were small and fast, allowing them to make quick work of the cave. They would eventually merge with other members of the troop via the small passageways. At this point, the scouts were scattered throughout the cave and it was getting harder for Donald to stay in control of the situation. There were 12 of them and only one of Donald, so he decided it was time to end the exploration because the kids were not following his rules and he thought things were starting to become unsafe. However, one more thing Donald wanted to do before ending the trip was make his way to that small room in the back of the cave. He made his way to an uncharted passage and felt a surge of excitement flow through him. It was as if he was a kid again and he started to become giddy with the feeling of exploring a new part of the cave that he has never seen before. He wasn't paying attention to the fact that the cave was getting narrower and narrower. This was not a problem for the scouts because they were so small, but Donald was much larger than them and the deeper he got into the cave, the more he had to contort his body to get through the passages. His clothes were completely covered in slime, and there were rips in his clothes due to all the tight squeezes that he was forcing his body through. Nevertheless, he was on a natural high and felt invincible. At this point, he had one thing on his mind, to make it to that small room. The passages were getting extremely narrow now, and he could not walk anymore, so he started to crawl headfirst through a section of the cave that narrowed into a cone-like passage. He was about 75 feet into the tight passage when suddenly he started sliding and fell headfirst into this very tight crevice. This was not a big deal at first because Donald could just wiggle his way out, just like he always had, and back up to the less restricted area. But he soon realized there was a major problem. His shoulders and hips were pinned and his head was caught at a 30 degree downward angle. He tried wiggling, but nothing happened. He tried again and felt the grip of the passage get tighter around him. It was harder to take a breath. He soon realized that he dislodged a stone and it acted as a keystone or a wedge. And when he tried to move back, it tightened. When he tried to move forward, it loosened. As Donald squirmed to free himself, the dislodged rock would move a few inches and then lodge itself against the passage's wall, making him more stuck. His heart was starting to beat faster because of the adrenaline, and because he was in a downward angle, his heart had to work harder to pump blood throughout his body. Donald now thought the only way he could get out would be to get help from someone else. He tried yelling for help, but no one was near him to hear his cries. 
It is unclear how long it took, but eventually one of the scouts heard him yelling and found his way down to Donald, and immediately went to get his sons Christopher and Roger so they could help their dad. Finally, Roger and Christopher made it over to their dad and immediately started trying to pull him out. They spent the next hour and a half trying to grab at him and get his legs free. At this point, a couple of scouts were also trying to help them, but nothing was working. After all their efforts failed, Roger made a plan to notify the troop that Donald was stuck and they needed rescue to get him out of the cave. Christopher left the cave to alert the authorities that his dad was stuck and needed help immediately. The scouts exited the cave with no issues and then the fear set in that their leader was stuck in a dangerous position in the cave. His body was under immense cardiovascular stress because he was stuck at that downward angle. When the human body is stuck at a downward angle for long periods, the heart must work overtime to plump blood right, mainly to keep it moving away from the brain and lungs, which tend to pool in this posture. Every minute he was in this position, things were getting worse. Numerous rescue groups arrived, some of which came from considerable distances. Initial attempts to pull Donald out by his feet were unsuccessful. Later, experienced spelunkers attempted to reach him from other sections of the cave, but they could only get to within two feet of his head. The rescuers could not believe how he got stuck in such a trying position. Another factor hurting his survival was the 57 degree temperature in the cave's depths and the rescue workers' inability to reach his head to provide him with warm fluids or other nourishment. Donald was in a lot of pain at this point because he was pushed on his side, and every breath he took required a constant effort. He was starting to think he would never get out to see his family again. It was unpleasant to think that he did not listen to his own caving rules and put himself in a dangerous position even though he preached safety to his scout troop. From Saturday until Sunday night, more expert cavers using drills, chisels, and ropes crawled into the entrances of the passageway where Donald was pinned. Unfortunately, they could still only reach his feet. They tried many different strategies to pull him out of the position, but it seemed like nothing was working. Donald was moaning and you could tell he was becoming less lucid by the minute. More extreme measures needed to be taken to get Donald out of the cave. In the next phase of rescue efforts, a 16 foot 8 inch shaft was drilled vertically into the cave on Sunday afternoon. Rescuers spent until 6 p.m. Monday drilling a passage sideways from the bottom of the shaft 11 feet through the bedrock next to Donald's head. After that, they attached a harness and rope to Donald's feet and then tried to pull him out of the wedge stones with a pulley system. Now with all these extra efforts, Donald was starting to think that despite his treachery, he would make it out of this cave alive. He had been in worse spots in his life and this was just another instance of something terrible happening to him and he would get himself out of it. Donald had remained coherent talking to rescue workers and even went as far as asking them to tell his wife that he would be late arriving home. During the rescue attempts from the crevice, cuts were inflicted to Donald's head and his back and some of his ribs were broken. He lost a great deal of blood from rocks hitting him and cutting him. At one point a rock broke free and hit him in the head, leaving a large gash. In addition, the pulling caused a sharp rock to cut his side. The rescue team tried everything, but nothing was working. Donald was in horrible shape and the doctors estimated that Donald would die from hypothermia or blood loss. Prolonged exposure to the cold walls of the cave produced incoherence at first then shock after Donald's body temperature dropped from a normal 98.6 degrees to below 80 degrees. State Trooper Pagano and others had become pessimistic about Donald's chances of survival as a nurse crawled through a 75-foot passageway in the cave Sunday morning and, and found no vital signs of life at pulse points in Donald's feet and legs. By Monday night, they were only able to pull him about 12 inches out of the crevice. They heard grunts from him at 2 a.m. Sunday, but Monday morning, Pagano said that they had no vital sign. Despite a massive rescue operation and Donald fighting for his life, he was officially pronounced dead 20 minutes before the rescue team pulled his body out. 
they were finally able to get him out by demolition of the hillside of the cave. Tearing out the hillside of bedrock around the cave with backhoes and dynamite. This led to the retrieval of his body. The operation lasted from 2 a.m. Tuesday until about 11.45 Tuesday night. An autopsy indicated that the official cause of death was hypothermia or extreme exposure suffered in his entombment for three and a half days in a narrow sloping crevice 16 feet underground. The post-mortem conducted that Dr. Alex Tershenkov, the Sussex County Medical Examiner, also indicated that Donald may have lived about 18 hours longer than rescuers had originally thought would be possible. Joanne Bellevue serves as the steward for the conservatory group. As a result of Donald's tragic death, Bellevue advises that guided tours of the cave are conducted under strict requirements, including prior spelunking experience with, with membership in a recognized caving organization. This is the graphic story of a man who entered Germany's deepest cave when disaster struck. This is his story. Professor Dox and other scientists say the Rysending cave system is almost certainly linked by an undiscovered super cave to another 50 mile long labyrinth comprised of some 4,000 caves in neighboring Austria. Nobody knows where the link is. Finding it would be a sensation. At a press conference in Germany, it was said that the event had opened a new chapter in Alpine history regarding one of the most extensive rescue attempts in history. But unfortunately, this cave is so deep it is impossible to rescue anyone from it. The operation became well known to the general public for the great rescue effort, taking over 700 members of a multi-international group of cave rescuers, consisting of people from Italy, Austria, Germany, Switzerland, Croatia, and others. The difficulty and complexity of the operation was unprecedented. In August 2015, the Interior Ministry of Bavaria reported the costs were estimated at around 960,000 euros. According to the Swiss rescue team leader, Andy Schuer, the different international groups had grown into one big family during the mission. At the same time, the Austrian representative said that even the strongest lads had tears in their eyes while conducting the mission. The danger of future missions in Rysending Cave is just too great, said Thomas Weber, the mayor of the district. As a result of this incident, the entrance to the cave was sealed by police to prevent further accidents by curious people and tourists. A special permit is now required and only issued to people with justified interest, physical suitability, and professional qualification. Johann Westhauser is a 52-year-old from Stuttgart, Germany. He works as a scientist at the Karlsruhe Technology Institute and is part of a team that discovered the Reisending cave system in Germany in 1995. He is an experienced caver and probably knows the Reisending cave as well as anyone else on Earth. Johann is no amateur in caving and has explored the Reisending system with his team named the Bad Kenstadt Cave Research Group many times. He is one of the founders of the group. The thrill of exploring the undiscovered parts of this cave was so intense for him that he returned again and again to discover its extremities. But now he wanted to push his exploration to the limits. So he planned the most extensive and risky expedition to re-enter the cave and take a shot at finding the connection to the super cave. The Rysending's name translates as gigantic thing. The cave is awe-inspiring, and once you enter and get a sense of the cave, it is like you have entered another planet. At 63,320 feet, it is the longest, and 3,760 feet, the deepest in Germany. So far, only 12 miles of its hundreds of tunnels, which plunge to a depth of 3,300 feet, have been mapped. The complex is a maze of blind alleys, waterfalls, chasms, and rock chimneys. The cavers must move along its damp, often slimy, rock-strewn passageways, then squeeze through water-filled gaps less than two feet wide. Most of the cave system remains unexplored. The exploration of this cave is analogous to an out-of-body experience. 
This place will be your worst nightmare if you are afraid of heights or risk adverse. Researchers say this cave system is the last undiscovered continent. You can discover new unexplored territory here. The cave was formed by acid-charged rain and groundwater seeping through openings in the limestone near the peak of the Untersberg Massif, a 6,400 foot tabletop mountain that towers over the landscape between Germany and Austria. Over time, the porous limestone dissolved away, leaving behind caverns and shafts like a river carving a canyon. Because it begins on the top of such a large mountain, the water formed rescending had a long way to travel before coming to rest at the water table, making it much more profound than other similar cave systems. Legend has it that 12th century Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I is asleep deep inside the Untersberg mountain, poised to wake and restore Germany to its ancient greatness as soon as its beard grows around the table three times or the ravens cease flying. So everyone has to be extra quiet inside. The rice ending is called a pit cave because of its vertical orientation, making it so technically challenging to traverse. Because the access shaft has much of the interior structure run straight up and down, cavers must descend and ascend on ropes for large parts of the cave's length. This requires expert level caving experience and is terrifying. Something was alluring about the feeling of remoteness for Johan, but he knew that preparation would be necessary for this environment to survive. Climbing was one thing, but exploring a cave like this added a new element for Johan that he and his colleagues needed to prepare for. Traditional rock climbing techniques are often infeasible or impossible in a deep pit cave like this. So instead, they had to use a unique piece of equipment called an ascender to inch back up to the same rope they used to rappel down, a technique sometimes called jummering or jugging. Reaching the bottom of this cave is never accomplished on a single trip by a single team. Therefore, the team brought hundreds of pounds of rope and associated hardware, along with food, water, lights, batteries, and a first aid kit. They were going all in on this expedition, despite the high risk of injury or death. Navigating this cave is a physical, technical, and even mental challenge. Johan and his colleagues spent weeks getting into shape to maximize their exploration of this cave and to allow them the greatest safety and make their movements easier. Then, they planned out their descent into the cave with detailed plans for each step of the way. If you're headed to the bottom of Rysending, you'll also need to bring a boat. About 3,051 feet below the entrance point, there is a vivid blue lake that must be crossed by a raft to proceed deeper into the cave. Swimming is not an option, with temperatures constantly hovering around freezing and humidity around 100%. Around 12 p.m. noon on the 7th of June, 2014, Johan and two colleagues entered the Rysending cave. Once they entered, they immediately had to get down the first deep shaft by anchoring ropes and rappelling down to the bottom. Once there, they reached the first base station. They were filled with excitement and determination to make it down the ropes. Foot by foot, they lowered themselves down the cold, damp cave with little to no light. They managed to make it down without any issues, but they were utterly exhausted from the descent. The cave was proving to test more than they were expecting, but they pressed on. Their blood was pumping hard, and they had to work for each breath. Johan felt strange as he strapped up to descend the second shaft. Although he had been planning this trip for a long time, he realized he was just going through the motions and not connecting with his colleagues. He was laser focused on the task at hand because he knew how dangerous this exploration was and any error in judgment could lead to his or one of his team members death. Even still, he decided to pay more attention to his teammates and live in this glorious moment. They started lowering themselves down the next shaft. The shaft was straightforward and they could make it down to base station two pretty easily. One of the teammates started to become distant 
and Johan realized he was experiencing a bit of shock from the expedition. The teammate's eyes were glazed over and he wasn't listening to instructions. If he didn't snap out of this, they would have a major safety issue. Johan gave him a pep talk and they decided to continue. The three then started to descent to the next station. Right from the start, Johan was having a hard time making his way down. The walls of this part of the cave were lined with loose rocks that were jagged in some places and could cause ropes to get snagged. Johan's rope was getting stuck on something and he knew this could cause a rock fall. The team continued to work their way down the shaft, but the cave walls were starting to become more dangerous the lower they went. Rocks were beginning to break from the sides of the walls and the team could not see where they were falling from. It was pitch black besides the small headlamps that each team member was wearing on top of their safety helmet. The team stopped to talk about the falling rock issue and decided that they had come too far to turn back and use the ascender to inch back up to the cave entrance. They might not have had enough energy to make it back up, so their only option was to go down. Johan's heart began to race and his mind was running with all of the potential scenarios that could happen next. Somehow, he was able to snap out of this and refocus. The descent was starting to get dangerous very quickly, and they all did a prayer before starting to work their way down the ropes again. Finally, after some time, they made it down to base station number three. They had one more challenging descent to make, and then they would be at the long straight part of the cave. This passage was horizontal and would give the group some time to rest from all of the descending. The team made it down to base station four, but they were tired at this point. Things were going according to plan as they worked their way down the long straight passage. They had been in the cave for over 10 hours and their focus and decision making abilities were starting to wane. After a couple more hours, they finally made it to base station number five and a feeling of exhilaration came over the team. This was a big deal because once they got past the next marker, base station six, they would be at the undiscovered part of the cave. This was the whole reason they were there for. Then they realized there was a problem. This part of the cave is treacherous and there was an increased chance of something threatening happening. If they get injured this deep in the cave, there's no way they would get out and this cave would end up being their tomb. At the end of the long straight, the team came to a part of the passage that was made up of loose rock. They were anticipating this part and decided to push forward to get across and make it to base station 6. Johan led the way and worked his way over the slippery rocks with one thing on his mind, to make it across safely. He was doing okay but the rocks started falling from the ceiling and he needed to take cover. It was pitch black so spotting the falling rocks was almost impossible. Out of nowhere, Johan was struck in the head by a large boulder and knocked unconscious. The rock hit him so hard it cracked through his plastic helmet. His body crumbled to the ground. The only sounds were those of the rocks that continued to fall. Johan was no match for the rock fall. His body was lifeless and there was nothing he could do to protect himself. At this time, the team had descended 3,280 feet down the cave. One of the teammates saw the whole thing happen to Johan and knew that the exploration was immediately over. It crossed their mind that a rescue operation would offer Johan very little to no hope. They feared this moment happening, and it happened. The two teammates were in shock. Johan was a good friend of theirs, and seeing him in this condition was heart-wrenching. They decided that one would stay with Johan and the other would return to the surface to get help. After 10 hours, the teammate made it safely to the cave entrance. After taking a massive gulp of fresh air and thanking God he made it, he called Mountain Rescue. The emergency crew jumped into action and started to plan the rescue of Johan from deep in the cave. Austrian rescuer Norbert Rosenberger told Germany's newspaper on Friday that the feat would be more complicated than retrieving an injured climber from the summit of Mount Everest. It would be one of the most extreme and dangerous rescue attempts ever made. 
About two days after Johan entered the cave, three groups of cave rescuers, 11 people in total, entered the cave to make their way toward him and their remaining teammate. A cave link system was established to send and receive essential communication signals through the solid rock, allowing the exchange of text messages between the cave entrance and the scene of the accident. The transport through the narrow passages and supplies of people inside and outside of the cave was challenging. The stretcher had been made shockproof to a certain extent. On the evening of June 11th, a physician reached Johan. He assessed him and a minor traumatic brain injury was diagnosed. And a second physician arrived later that night. It was decided that Johan was fit to be transported out of the cave. The paths within the cave had to be secured with additional fixed ropes, bolts, and footrests. At peak times, up to 60 people were in the cave, and 90% of all cave rescue equipment of the Bavarian Mountain Rescue had been used. Unfortunately, there were no engines or other machinery available, so all work had to be done by hand. In vertical passages, the rescue staff used their own bodies as a counterweight to the stretcher. Bavarian Mountain Rescue Authorities confirmed that Johan had been brought to the top of the cave on June 19th at 11.44 a.m. Shortly after midday, he was airlifted to a hospital in Bavaria. Johan had to spend about two weeks in the trauma center, including an operation the following week for his cheekbone fracture, and then undergo several months of rehabilitation. Eric Estably is trapped in the pitch black Dragonair Go Cave. His only hope is to find the airspace on the other side of a rockfall. Unfortunately, the rockfall sealed him inside the cave. It is said that only eight divers in the world are thought to be capable of carrying out this type of rescue mission that would save Eric. One rescue diver said that he does not think anyone would have gone on this rescue mission without thinking that there might be a bad ending. So you tend to prepare yourself for the worst. This is the graphic reaccount of Eric Estably's journey to map the unexplored parts of the Dragonair Go Cave. While Dragonair Go Cave has been explored extensively by Eric and his friends, it is not a well-known or frequently visited cave. It is in an area of France called Ardèche. This region of France is beautiful, but deadly water-filled caves are below the surface. The only animals that are able to live in this cave, about 180 feet directly below ground level, are tiny shrimp. Dragonair Go Cave is one of the most technically challenging to dive, and that is why it appealed to Eric. There is a high chance of getting trapped in the unexplored parts of this cave, which would cause the diver to panic, making escaping the cave much less of a possibility. Another reason why most divers never venture into this cave is because it is very silty. Visibility is usually at a maximum of a few feet. The problem is being able to operate in these conditions and make it through the cave safely. You have to be extremely careful not to kick up too much silt or you will cause a blackout and be blind. You will not be able to tell which direction is up or down and you will have to wait until the silt dissipates until you can continue through the tight passages of the cave. Hopefully, the silt clears before your air runs out. In these caves, air pockets might seem tempting to take a break from the scuba air and take a breath but this is an unwise decision unless you are highly experienced. Air trapped in caves can easily be bad air, which can cause impairing physical symptoms, blood acidosis, and death in extreme cases. Although Eric considered all of these dangers and spent an extensive time preparing for this dive, he was hell-bent on mapping the unexplored parts of this cave. Eric Estably is a highly experienced diver who values his family, friends, and diving equally, but his life passion is diving, particularly cave diving. He runs an underwater engineering business. He is 46 and began caving in the 1990s when he was around 20. His three regular diving companions, Didou, Philippe, and Emric, joined him on most of his adventures. The three friends carried out many expeditions together, 
and constantly shared stories with their families. Eric has a son, Arthur, and is married to his wife, Evelyn. Eric would spend a lot of time telling cave stories to Arthur, but his son didn't fully commit to the sport until he was 20 and fell in love with it while on a school trip. Evelyn was Eric's number one supporter, and she pushed Eric to chase his dreams. Over time, Eric would rack up the diving hours until he eventually became very comfortable diving difficult caves. This allowed him to challenge technical cave dives that very few people in the world would ever attempt. His driving passion in cave diving was to map out new unseen parts. He did this repeatedly, but there was one cave that he was determined to map out the most, and that was Dragonair Go Cave in France. He dived this cave many times, and on each trip, he would map out another piece of it. It was his calling, and he did it very well. If you were talking to Eric and you felt like he was not paying attention to you, he was probably thinking about Dragonair Go Cave. It consumed him. It made him happy. Eric is the type of person who lights up any room he enters. He always has a smile on his face and is known to be one of the nicest people in the cave diving community. He would have many other divers join him on his excursions and they never regretted joining Eric because they could learn from his extensive experience. Eric was a member of the caving club Saint Valet du Che. He had performed cave rescues on other divers and is recognized for always having a cool head even when presented with extreme underwater challenges. On Sunday, October 3rd, 2010, Eric entered the Dragonair Go Cave. He was planning on pursuing the exploration past the current mapped out parts, about 3,412 feet inside the cave, at a depth of about 285 feet. His dive was to last six hours, so he brought the necessary equipment, which included two rebreathers, two scooters, five air tanks, and 1,476 feet of dive line. Eric needed all of this gear to make it past the unexplored passages. He was excited, nervous, and focused while he made his way deeper and deeper into the cave. The dive was going according to plan, and he made it about 1,200 feet into the cave before his first silt blackout. He unexpectedly hit one of the muddy walls of the cave and this caused the silt to kick up all around him. He could not believe how quickly it happened, but he knew that if he waited, the silt would dissipate and then he could continue. If the silt did not clear away, he would have to return and abort the dive. If he tried to make it through the silt, he could get a piece of his equipment snagged on something sharp that could cut his airline or cause his buoyancy vest to rip and he would sink to the bottom of the cave. After some time, he continued down the cave. His visibility was not getting better than 12 inches, even with his very bright headlamp. He had to focus all of his energy going down the correct passages and not getting his equipment snagged. He is very deep into the cave with very little visibility, all alone in the pitch black. Finally, he continued down a tight passage and came out on the other side. All of a sudden, he was in the midst of a rock fall in the cave and he needed to move immediately. He swam forward, but the silt kicked up again, instantly blinding him and causing a blackout. His headlamp was no match for the silt, encompassing everything. This was very bad for Eric and he knew he had to get out of the situation or he would be trapped run out of air, or die. He needs to get to the other side of that rockfall. He tried to find another way out, but the obstruction blocked every spot he came across. He had only a limited amount of air and no way to get out of the cave. He ditched some of his gear to be more agile in the tight passages. He needed to find an airspace or he would suffocate from lack of oxygen once his air tanks were empty. He also knew that if rescue were to enter the cave, they would see that he left his gear in a conscious effort and that he might still be alive after the rockfall. Eric was now trapped on the wrong side of the rockfall, which was several meters thick. This was his worst nightmare. Because Eric did not show up outside of the cave when he was supposed to check in, rescue was notified. On Monday, 
October 4th, British and Swiss rescue divers arrived on site early in the morning. Rick Stanton and John Valanthin were called in. The two volunteer British cave divers are believed to be the first to locate 12 tie boys in their coach after nine days of searches, regarding one of the most publicized cave rescue in history. They have worked together on major global search and rescue operations. Rick Stanton is a British civilian cave diver specializing in rescues through the Cave Rescue Organization and the British Rescue Council. They have both been called one of the world's most accomplished divers and the face of British cave diving, also the best cave divers in Europe. Rick, aged in his mid-50s, is a firefighter who hails from Coventry and has more than 35 years of experience in caving. Rick combines expertise in dry caving and technical caving. In 2013, he described his numerous search and rescue missions as my hobby. John is a computer engineer who runs marathons in his spare time and lives in Bristol. John has technical skills including pushing the limits of rebreather technology, thought to be used by the pair as they navigated the 30 mile long Tom Lang Nang Nong network in northern Thailand. They will attempt to rescue their friend Eric trapped in the cave. They knew Eric, having met him a few years earlier in France. Eric had once helped John gain access to another cave, so when John and Rick were asked if they would fly to the cave, they did not hesitate. With them, they brought first aid, food, and heat packs for their trip inside the cave and expected it to take about five to seven hours. After that, the second team of Swiss divers is ready to go, if needed. The two British divers entered the cave around 3 p.m. and would go to the end of the known exploration site at about 3,000 feet. As they made their way through the water, sediment was so thick they could barely see the lights on their helmets. After 2,427 feet down the cave, the two found out why it was so thick. They described it as an underwater avalanche that had disturbed the mud on the floor of the cave. Rick and John eventually found a small hole in the rock fall, but their bulky equipment stopped them from getting through. They were 2,559 feet from the cave entrance at this point, but now they had to turn back because their air was running low. This was a bad sign that they did not find Eric on their first rescue attempt, but now they knew the scenario that they were dealing with inside the cave. They would have to devise a new rescue plan and resupply before making another rescue attempt. The British divers reported that clearing the rockfall within the cave did not look possible. Meanwhile, Wednesday morning, an impassable vertical shaft is now being dug by a civil engineering crew with heavy equipment to try to gain access to the upstream part of the cave. At the same time, a team of cavers is exploring a nearby cave which actually might lead to a connection with the Dragonair cave system. If this cave connects, it could be the exit that Eric needs to escape the cave. The Swiss diving team made another rescue attempt as soon as the silt in the cave began to clear up. They entered the cave and were able to make it to the rockfall with no issues, but after searching for a way through for hours, they had to turn back to resupply. A big backhoe dug open a trench that allowed access to a fissure where the cavers are now trying to connect into the Dragonair cave. The narrow aperture is filled with rocks that needed to be removed. The diggers got about 50 feet down in the fissure and there is another 210 feet down to the level of the cave passage. They pinpointed the exact spot they thought Eric would be if he could find an air surface. Hopefully, this aperture will connect or lead to the air-filled passage where Eric is hopefully waiting. Rick and John entered the cave for their second attempt. They devised a new strategy to get Eric in the cave by working with expert divers Pedro Barlotti and Luigi Castelli. They planned to use a slimmer diving apparatus to fit through a narrow gap within the rockfall. They returned to the spot where Eric's emergency scooter was to see if perhaps there was a way that could be found up and over the rockfall. Once they examined the rockfall, it became clear that Eric had tried to crawl through the obstruction. There was a gap that they could get through. Now that they had this information, they would have to return to the cave entrance and resupply for a third rescue dive. After some time of resting and resupply, Rick and John entered the cave again and quickly returned to the obstruction in record time. 
they had to push through the rockfall if there was any chance of saving Eric. Finally, they got through the gap they found near the top of the rockfall in the cave ceiling. This was a risky maneuver because if they hit the top of the ceiling, it would cause an instant silt blackout and they would be blind. Luckily, this did not happen. They were able to get through okay, but there was no sign of Eric on the other side. They swam another 600 feet down the cave. They were now in the unexplored part of the cave and they were taking a huge risk searching for Eric at this point. Rick and John are so experienced and mentally tough that they were able to continue very deep into the cave. They held on to hope that Eric was in an airspace waiting to be rescued. They were determined to rescue their friend. At this point, the pair is in the middle of a long passage that had clear visibility. Then they looked down and saw Eric 15 feet beneath them. It was astonishing how deep Eric was in this cave. They didn't know how he made it this far. It was clear that he was trying to find an airspace, but unfortunately, he ran out of air before that could happen. It took 10 days to find Eric deep within the cave. They prepared Eric's body to bring it back to the cave entrance. This would be an arduous task, but this is why they were there. As Rick and John were on their way out of the cave, Eric's body got stuck in the narrow gap in the rockfall. They tried to get it through, but one of them would have to be behind the body, and they could not have done this without being trapped themselves. So they had to leave the body in the cave. The next most important thing was to recover the diving computer on his wrist. Rick and John were not safe yet, and they still had their own situation on their hands, which was making it back to the cave entrance. They went so far into the cave and used so much air in the process, it would be a close call for them to make it out safe. So they grabbed the dive computer and started their way back down the cave the way they came. Luckily, they didn't run into any issues, and they made it back to the cave entrance safely. The computer was handed to the French cops. It revealed how Eric's dive progressed and where he had died. According to his onboard computer, he drowned on his first day. Despite several weeks of effort, the speleologists could not extract his body from the cave, and the French Speleology Federation announced the end of the search operations on January 8, 2011. However, Eric's body is still in the cave. French teams are now trying to get to him by drilling through rock. I want to say thanks for watching the video, and don't forget to subscribe if you like the content. As always, please be nice to the like button, and I have many other disaster videos on my channel that you might want to check out. See you at the next one.